Great, thanks, Lizzie. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Army Worm in Australia and Fall Army Worm in 2021, brought to you by Local Land Services, Central West and Central Tablelands in collaboration. This project is supported through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. I'm Rowan Leach, the Regional Ag Land Care Facilitator with Central West LLS, and together with my colleague Liz Davis from Central Tablelands LLS, I've invited the experts from Caesar Australia to present on armyworm species and their significant impact on agriculture in the southeast of Australia. This is part of a series of webinars Caesar will, be, will present on behalf of LLS, so keep an eye out for them in coming months. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respects to the traditional own custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. We welcome Dr Lizzie Lowe and Associate Professor Paul Yumina from Caesar Australia. Lizzie is a senior, senior extension scientist with Caesar and is based in Sydney. And Paul is a director at Caesar Australia and since completing his PhD in entomology has spent the last 15 years helping Australian farmers achieve a balance between profitability and environmental sustainability. Additionally, we also welcome Dr. Lisa Bird, the Senior Research Scientist in charge of New South Wales Department of Primary Industries Fall Army Worm Response, who's based in Tamworth. Lisa will present on the management strategies currently being advised to producers in New South Wales. I'll now hand over to Lizzie to begin today's webinar. Thanks, Lizzie. Uh, thanks very much, Rowan. So I'm just going to be in the background today. I'm going to be monitoring the chat and that is where you can ask any questions that you have during the webinar. There'll definitely be time for questions afterwards. If you have any problems, you can message me um, and otherwise, um, let's get started. Paul, handing over to you. Okay, thanks, uh, Lizzie and Rowan. Uh, I assume everyone can see the slides okay and hear me okay? Yep, okay. All right, look, as I guess Rowan alluded to, um, I guess what I will talk to today is a little bit about, I guess, army worms more broadly that I guess we commonly encounter in broadacre systems in New South Wales and indeed um, all of Southeastern Australia. I'll touch on fall army worm, a little bit about the background, but obviously we are very fortunate today, as Rowan mentioned, to have uh, Lisa Bird from New South DPI today who is really one of, I guess, Australia's experts on fall army worm. And we're going to hear some, I'm sure, very insightful information from Lisa around uh, fall army worm resistance and, and I guess some of the management strategies that we might need to be considering as we move into the summer period. So let's jump into it. So yeah, I think where I'm going to start is with army worms more broadly, and I guess most people uh, perhaps we'll, we'll already be familiar with the outbreaks that we saw last year in terms of army worms. Um, and I think there's some, you know, certainly some value in, in touching on that experience that we had last year. Um, so I, I guess, you know, uh, providing a little bit of context about why we saw that outbreak, what are the different species that we're likely to see in our broadacre crops and pastures? Because I think hopefully, you know, some of that insight, some of that knowledge will, I guess, hold us in good stead as we start to um, learn more about fall armyworm over the, the coming years and also as we start to think about how fall armyworm might move around the landscape and how we might, uh, I guess, manage fall armyworm in amongst all these other armyworm species. So I'm going to start with armyworms in 2020. Um, as I mentioned, last year was a pretty big year for, all, for, uh, for armyworms. I guess, though, where I probably should begin is just talking about what armyworms are. Um, and I guess just to be very clear, they're not worms. Army worm is basically, a, I guess, a catch-all for the larval stage of uh, a number of different related moth species. Uh, so they're the caterpillars of a large number of different uh, moths that we have here in Australia. And basically what is quite interesting about these species is that they do typically build up in very large numbers in the inland regions of Australia. So in those inland arid, par arid parts of Australia is where these species typically build up and then they migrate south into our agricultural regions. So these are not species that we, we necessarily have um, year in, year out or season in, season out. Um, they're highly migratory. And that's a key, I guess, element of what I want to touch on today, because again, it's quite important to understand what are the triggers, um, what are the, I guess, precursors for population buildups in these regions um, and movement down into our agricultural regions. <clears throat> 
just to, I guess, a word of, of note, there are many species. We're not just talking about one or two different armyworm species that we have, that we find in broadacre crops and pastures. In New South Wales, uh, there are many species. Um, and I guess importantly, these species do have some differences. You know, they have some different uh, plant host preferences, uh, but also their biologies are, are a little bit different as well. So for example, some of these species have different tolerances to temperatures. Um, and that does play out on the time of year in which we typically see some of these species. Um, and I guess, you know, for, for most people, it may be uh, pretty obvious how to distinguish armyworms in the field, but, but I don't want to assume that everyone knows this. Um, these caterpillars do look superficially quite similar to a whole range of other caterpillars that we might find, including um, native budworm. Um, I guess one of the key distinguishing features that you can see quite nicely here in this photo is that the caterpillars um, have something called a cervical shield. It's basically the segment immediately behind their, their head. And what you can see on the cervical shield of armyworms is three lateral stripes. And so you can see that quite easily here in this photo. And that's a really, I guess, nice distinguishing feature that you can use when out in the field. And it's pretty obvious, particularly as the larvae, um, I guess, do get uh, quite large. As I mentioned before, there are a whole number of different species of armyworms. I've listed here, I guess, some of the more common ones that we find um, in our sorts of systems in broadacre, I guess, cropping systems in southeastern Australia. I guess I'm not going to spend too much time talking about these, though, but I just do want to point out the two most common species that we deal with in winter cereals in New South Wales are the common armyworm and the southern armyworm, these two species here listed at the top. Um, and these do have some, some slight differences in terms of when we're likely to see them uh, migrate down. The southern armyworm is typically the species that we see most commonly when we have armyworms getting in early in the year. So during that early sort of autumn, um, well, sort of mid-autumn, early winter period, um, we can find armyworms some years. That's typically the southern armyworm, which comes down a little bit earlier. And it does persist right through the, I guess, the winter period into early spring. Uh, the common armyworm, um, which is, is one we see a lot of, um, typically come down, comes down later. So it, it typically sort of migrates down in spring and persists actually later into the season than the southern armyworm. So those, those are the two species that we see, you know, certainly most um, in New South Wales, particularly in our winter cereal systems. Um, and certainly last year, this, you know, very big outbreak year that we saw, those two species were certainly the most common um, that we did find. Inland armyworm is, is often there, but it's, it's, it's certainly not as uh, major a pest um, in our part of the world. Um, as I mentioned, there are other species of armyworms. Um, the last one there, obviously, we're going to talk a fair bit about today, the full armyworm, which is obviously you know, recently established. Um, but again, I'm not, not going to go into to too much about the different species, but I think it's just worth noting what are the most common species and when we're likely to find these. Obviously, I've already alluded to the fact that last year we, we had a bit of an outbreak year with armyworms. There was quite a lot of concern. There was quite a lot of reports. There was quite a lot of chat about armyworms last year. And in fact, there was quite a lot of chat about armyworms leading into this year as well, given, I guess, some people um, were, were se severely affected uh, last year um, with armyworms. So I think it's just useful to kind of stop and, and reflect upon what drives these armyworm outbreaks that we do see uh, from time to time. These are things that don't happen annually. Um, they're much more sporadic, but we do have a pretty good understanding of the biology of these species. And we, we kind of understand what the precursors are or what the ingredients are that give rise to, I guess, this perfect storm. The first thing really is around, I guess, the conditions that are experienced in that inland part of Australia. So in that inland arid region, um, basically what we need is we need adequate summer and autumn rainfall that basically allows the plant hosts to germinate and to, uh, and to grow adequately. And of course, that then allows the armyworm populations to build up. Um, so that's critical. If we have drought or dry conditions in the inland region, these populations can't build up at that source point. So that's, I guess, the key ingredient, number one. The next thing, of course, we need is we, we require suitable atmospheric, I guess, conditions for the long range uh, moth migration. Um, so as I've alluded to, uh, these moths migrate down from these inland source populations. Um, depending on the year, um, it can vary a little bit in terms of the timing and, of course, depending on the species. But basically what we require is we require these northerly winds that these moths can then get up into that jet stream and then they can be, uh, I guess, um, transported down into our agricultural regions. So we need those favourable, uh, I guess, wind conditions uh, 
um, to have an armyworm outbreak. And of course, the, the last key ingredient is that once those moths arrive into our agricultural regions, we needed to have had some suitable rain here in the agricultural um, areas that obviously allows grasses or you know, emerging cereals to have um, uh, germinated, to have started to grow. Um, because of course, the moths um, basically um, have a pretty hard time of it in terms of that movement over such long distances. They don't persist down here very long. They need to lay eggs pretty quickly. Um, so they need to be able to find suitable hosts down here um, to be able to lay those eggs. Um, so they are the three ingredients basically that we need. And basically last year is, um, it's exactly what we saw. We had this combination of events uh, that gave rise to um, this outbreak in 2020. Um, so what did we see last year? We had very, very high numbers of reports. Um, and in fact, those reports started quite early. Uh, they were happening in autumn and they persisted right through winter and right through to late spring, um, even sort of ticking over into early summer. Um, and we know we had a number of different species. We had both the common um, and the Southern army worm and, and they were sort of uh, both persisting, but at slightly different times of the year. Of course, and I'm sure there are some, some people here today that experienced this themselves, that there were some pretty, pretty large populations of caterpillars being seen in cereal crops, particularly in that late winter um, spring period. There was some pretty significant damage that was occurring in a number of instances. And there was a lot of, uh, I guess, chemical intervention, depending on where you were, I guess, in southeastern Australia. I guess though I do want to make the important point that there were also many, many cases that we heard about and, and I guess that we're aware of where despite pretty large populations of these army worms in cereal crops, um, there was actually no economic damage caused by the caterpillars themselves. And I think that's always a really important point to make um, that despite some pretty large numbers um, being found in crops doesn't necessarily mean that we have to intervene necessarily. And we know, as I said last year, there are a number of agronomists, a number of growers that I guess held their nerve, that tried to consider the timing of where the larvae were at and how that was going to coincide with crop senescence um, and decided to hold off on any intervention. And in fact, you know, in many cases we're aware of last year, that actually proved to be a very, very sensible decision. Um, despite, you know, certainly defoliation of some of these cereal crops later in the, I guess, growth stages, that didn't actually impact on yield whatsoever. And so that's obviously you know, important to consider, right? We don't need to spray these things just because they're out there in large numbers necessarily. Um, this figure here basically just gives you a quick snapshot, a quick overview of, of where some of the reports of armyworms came from last year through our PestFact Southeastern service. Um, you know, this is certainly by no means picking up all of the armyworm instances last year or by any means the magnitude of the number of reports, but I guess it just gives you a snapshot that, you know, we were seeing armyworm issues right across southeastern Australia. Um, in terms of armyworms, you know, I guess there are really two key risk periods of the year. Um, you know, I guess the first one is that armyworms, if they're coming in early um, in, in, I guess, um, you know, autumn and, and early winter, the, the caterpillars can certainly feed on the leaves and the young tillers. Um, and look, if there's very heavy defoliation, it can hold the crop back. And we certainly saw that last year and people were having to spray early on in the year. But generally at that time of year, I guess there is minimal economic impact unless you know, the crop's you know, stressed or we're getting really, really high levels. Um, also, I guess it's important to note for those that aren't aware, you know, these damaging infestations of armyworms that happen during that early stage, so during autumn and winter, are almost always associated with standing stubble. So crops that are being sown into standing stubble. And that's because the standing stubble provides the perfect medium upon which the moth will actually lay her eggs. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind, um, you know, moving forwards. But of course, and I'm sure many of you guys are, are well aware of this, as the crops dry down, uh, the damage that can be caused by army worms can be much more severe. And I guess it's at this stage of the year um, where the crops, um, I guess, become much more attractive, or at least the parts of the crop, the nodes and the stems that stay green, become very attractive to armyworms. So the armyworms will, will move up the plant as the crop senesces. Um, and if the larvae are at a later stage of development, 
um, and it coincides with when the crops are senescing and you've got those green nodes and stems, um, then that's when you get head lopping. And head lopping, of course, can be terribly, terribly damaging, uh, particularly if you've got um, large numbers of, of caterpillars um, in a field. So there are some thresholds, um, but these are not well-established thresholds. These are not empirically derived thresholds. Um, I guess these are more rules of thumb. Um, however, they have been, I guess, around and developed over a number of years by many experienced agronomists um, in conjunction with researchers. And I think they're pretty decent. And I think they're worth flagging here today because again, you know, we, we don't necessarily need to be um, intervening um, with chemicals necessarily, um, just because we're seeing armyworms in a cereal crop in, in a given year. The thresholds or the rules of thumb that are out there that I think are pretty reasonable are basically this. Um, if you have around eight to 10 larvae per metre squared during that winter to early spring period, then there may be a need um, to intervene. Anything less than that, then I think, you know, the, the, the history will show us that you don't often need to uh, control armyworm populations. But of course, as we move into the later time of year, so as we move into that crop ripening stage in cereals, the threshold is reduced significantly because of course, we're heading into that head lopping period. Um, and obviously, you know, what we see um, is that the, the, um, the thresholds, uh, particularly in crops like barley, become uh, quite low. So in barley, I think that the general consensus is around one to two larvae per metre squared, um, because obviously barley has that, that much thinner stem, it's much more susceptible to head lopping. Uh, typically, you know, that is, I guess, a threshold that, that a lot of people, um, at least in our part of the world, uh, tend to, I guess, rely upon. But again, I just wanna make the point really carefully here is that that's a threshold based on density alone. The really critical thing with head lopping and army worms is understanding the synchrony of the life stage of the caterpillar you have and whether that is actually going to coincide with when the crop is at that crop ripening stage. And last year, we saw many, many cases, as I mentioned before, where sprays weren't necessary. Um, and that proved to be a very, very sensible decision because what we found was the caterpillars were actually going to already pupate and therefore stop feeding before the crops were at that, um, I guess, high risk period. So really important that when thinking about um, armyworms, more so than most other species, we don't just look purely at density, but we look at the growth stage and where the crop is at in its, uh, I guess, plant development stage. So uh, I guess just wrapping up, I guess the, 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 the information about armyworms more broadly, um, clearly monitoring is going to be key as it is for, for almost all um, insects that we find in broadacre crops. The first thing you're likely to see is probably damage to the foliage. You may not necessarily see the caterpillars immediately. Um, of course, the, the type of feeding damage that you'll see from armyworms is pretty similar to other caterpillars. It's, it's that classic chewing damage of the tillers and leaves. Uh, and I guess the reason I say that you're more likely to see the, the damage first than the caterpillars is that armyworms are primarily nocturnal feeders. Um, and so you certainly see caterpillars out um, during the middle of the day and, and during the daytime feeding, uh, but often you get uh, greater feeding activity at night. So when you're out there monitoring, certainly of course, look in the plant foliage, but it's really important to actually check the ground as well. Um, armyworms love to uh, sort of burrow just below that leaf litter, particularly at the base of plants. And so you wanna get down and you wanna scratch around, uh, I guess the soil surface to actually determine uh, what in fact is there um, and are they actually army worms to begin with. Um, of course, you know, sweep netting um, or if beet sheet is your preferred monitoring tool, they're also very effective ways in which to monitor for army worms. But again, they may actually be an underestimate of the population size because you're likely to not be, I guess, collecting the entire population. You're likely to have a proportion of individuals that are actually not up in the plant vegetation and therefore are not going to be caught in your sweep net or beet sheet. Now, there are many instances where insecticides will be needed. I'm, I'm certainly um, not suggesting that that's not the case. And last year, there were cases where insecticides um, were, were warranted, um, uh, given, I guess, the, the, uh, the size of the populations that we were seeing in some parts of, of uh, Victoria and, and southern New South Wales. I guess just the point I wanted to make here with insecticides and army worms is that penetration is really, really important. Um, and I guess I say that particularly if you've got a high yielding crop where you've got a thick canopy, 
um, it can be very difficult to get contact with the larvae because of this behavior where they're often at the base of plants, perhaps even under the, you know, the, the leaf litter a little bit. Um, you know, so penetration is really, really key if you're trying to get good control. Um, so you can't skimp on water rates um, and because they're nocturnal. Um, and again, I think people, you know, probably already know this, but, but just in case some aren't aware, um, I guess there's a general recommendation that it's better to spray late afternoon, early evening, if you can, um, when chasing armyworms. And finally, if we look at armyworms this year, we've been really focusing on what we saw last year and I guess more broadly about how armyworms migrate and a little bit about their biology and, and I guess management. Um, this year has been very light. You know, in fact, there's been very few armyworm issues, um, at least ones that we're aware of. Um, certainly nothing like what we saw last year. Um, you know, they are very, very different seasons. Um, through our pest facts, I guess service this year, we've only received about 12 reports um, so far fewer numbers that we've heard about this year. And in fact, a lot of those reports as well, you know, we're hearing that the numbers are in fact pretty low. We're not hearing of any um, real concerns um, or at least not major concerns with army worms this year. Um, so that's pretty interesting, right? Last year was a really big outbreak year. This year, it's been very, very quiet. Um, and in fact, for us, that's actually not surprising. And in fact, at the GRDC updates earlier in the year, uh, we did predict that despite all the concern about army worms, because people were caught out last year, we actually thought this year would be quiet. And I guess the reason we, we think that is something that we can you know, say with some degree of confidence is that that phenomenon has been seen time and time again when we have uh, army worm outbreaks in Australia. And in fact, it's a common phenomenon than you see overseas in these highly migratory species. Typically after a big outbreak year, the following year we don't get, um, and of course there's always exceptions, but typically you don't then get, uh, I guess, another big year. And I guess the general consensus as to why that's probably the case is because of beneficials. What typically we think happens is that the beneficials get a foothold in those source populations because there's just massive numbers of resources. There's huge numbers in those inland regions. The beneficials build up and basically they take over and basically they get a foothold and they basically suppress the populations the following year or the following summer and autumn which basically prevents large numbers of, of moths from migrating down into our agricultural regions the following year. Um, so, so that's exactly what we're seeing um, in this, in this um, instance. So I wanna start now, I guess, moving over to full armyworm. And of course, I'm sure that's probably what most people are interested in hearing about. Um, and as I said up front, you know, I, I guess my job here is really just to introduce full armyworm and talk a little bit about some work that we've been doing uh, here at CESAR. So the background of fall armyworm is, is pretty interesting. Uh, for those not aware, it's, it's a, a species that's native to the Americas. Um, it's, you know, it's been a, a pest in that region for many, many years. But very recently, this species has undergone a pretty impressive range expansion around the world. Um, so fall armyworm were first reported about five years ago in Africa and has since caused some pretty significant issues in that continent. Um, not long after, a couple of years later, it was reported in the Indian subcontinent and it's now... was detected at the beginning of last year in Australia. So really massive range expansion in a very, very short number of years. Um, so really quite impressive. Um, fall armyworm also uh, quite impressively has a huge plant host list. Um, it's very, very polyphagous. Um, some reports have it as attacking more than 350 plant types. Um, so, you know, it can attack a, a very, very wide variety of uh, crops, um, pastures um, and weeds. But of course, they're not all the same. Um, and what we know is that fall armyworm certainly has a strong preference for crops like maize, uh, sweet corn um, and even sorghum. So how do we identify fall armyworm? Um, well, look, clearly it, it looks um, obviously superficially like many of our other armyworms, you know, the ones that I've talked about today, common armyworm and southern armyworm. Um, you know, and it can be very easily, I guess, misidentified. Uh, quite similar to those other army worms, the larvae, you know, you can actually see quite a lot of colour variation. So don't be fooled by the image here. They're not all necessarily uh, this colour. Uh, I guess come a, a couple of the key distinguishing features are that the fall army worm has four dark spots that basically form a square on the second to last body segment. Um, you can see that here if you can see my cursor. 
And then at the other end of the body, I guess something that's quite distinctive um, with fall armyworm relative to the other armyworm species that we already have in Australia is that they have a dark head, but on that head, it has a pale upside down, um, I guess, Y on the front. Um, and again, it might be a little bit small, but, but you might be able to see that here in this image. Um, they're two certainly key distinguishing features of fall armyworm relative to the other armyworm species that you're already, I guess, very familiar with in Australia. Like all caterpillars, you know, I guess fall armyworm goes through a whole variety of life stages. Basically, it starts with, you know, eggs. The female lays very large numbers of eggs. Um, these batches of eggs can be, you know, in excess of 100 eggs. These eggs develop through time. Uh, assuming we've got suitable conditions, we get, we get mass hatching of the caterpillars. And of course, these caterpillars immediately start feeding on the leaves. Um, these caterpillars grow. And as I mentioned before, you can get quite a lot of colour variation in the larvae. As they develop, uh, they do tend to get a little bit darker. And, and I've already talked about some of the distinguishing features on the back and the head of the, uh, of the caterpillars, which become more evident as the caterpillars, uh, I, get, I guess, get more uh, developed and larger. Um, and it's, I guess, this uh, later in stars, you know, when the caterpillars are around three to four centimetres, when, of course, they're most damaging. Um, and that, again, is true of all armyworms. It's the later instars that can be most damaging to, uh, to crops. Of course, like um, other caterpillars, the fall armyworm will then pupate. Um, and after a period of time, the moths will emerge. And of course, the females will lay eggs to complete the life cycle. Um, so that's basically what you know, we, we know a fall armyworm. So what does the feeding damage look like? Well, look, it looks pretty similar to army worms that we have already in Australia. Of course, it's, it's chewing. Um, and you've probably seen some of these uh, images before. The one on the left or the two on the left are images from uh, full army worm damage to maize crops that um, come from the US. Um, and these images on the right, uh, I guess, are some images that we've been provided by uh, QDAF. Uh, from Melina Miles up there. And this is some early damage that, you know, we saw in Queensland of full armyworm caterpillars attacking corn plants. Um, so you can see, you know, um, <laughs> some of this damage can be really quite severe, um, uh, particularly on these susceptible crops like maize, uh, sweet corn and sorghum. Um, from what I know, there's been relatively few issues to date uh, in pulses and, and wheat, although Lisa might have some more recent uh, information on that. Um, and although, of course, full armyworm can get into pastures, um, again, I don't think at the moment full armyworm are really considered a major threat to pasture industries in Australia. I already alluded to the fact that, you know, over the last five years or so, full armyworm underwent this, this massive range expansion around the globe. And I guess that, that sort of large spread potential, if you like, you know, we've already seen evidence for that here in Australia. So basically, full army worm were detected at the very top of the Cape York Peninsula in, in February last year. Um, and this is basically where they'd been detected as of July last year. So only sort of six months later. Um, basically, you can see that full army worm were found, you know, right across Queensland into Northern Territory and in fact, right across to WA. Um, so this is only in six months time. So again, it really illustrates, I guess, the huge migratory potential that this species has. And so one of the things that I guess we here at Caesar Australia did um, early on when fall armyworm was detected in Australia was to try to understand what that spread potential was. Where were fall armyworm likely to spread in Australia? And, and I guess from that, you know, where are the kind of the, the high risk areas? But also quite importantly, you know, trying to understand the establishment potential. Where are fall armyworm likely to establish in Australia? And so basically we had a project that um, was led by James Mayno and Raf Shooten here at Season Australia. And fortunately for us, we were able to leverage some very, very excellent research and, and knowledge of full armyworm biology from all the years of experience and research that had un been undertaken in uh, other countries. And basically what you can see here in this uh, map of Australia is where we see these reds and yellows Basically, that's demonstrating where in Australia we have um, conducive environmental conditions where fall, fall armyworm is able to undergo uh, permanent year-round population growth. So where it's able to go year-round um, successful life cycle uh, development, if you like. So you can see that clearly fall armyworm has a preference uh, 
for warmer, more northerly regions of Australia. And in fact, if you look at Southern Australia, the predictions are that fall armyworm will not be able to undergo year round population development and therefore survival. Um, so I guess selfishly for us here in the South, you know, we were pl pretty pleased when we looked at these modeling outputs because it basically meant that in our part of the world, in Victoria, and, and obviously as we move up even into Southern and Central New South Wales, it would appear full armyworm is not going to be able to successfully establish based on what we know about, I guess, the biology from overseas. Of course, this species could adapt um, to Australia and we don't entirely know how it's going to bed down under Australian conditions, but this is basically what we expect to happen at least in the short term. So that's pretty, you know, that's pretty comforting for us in the South. I guess it's certainly not, um, you know, surprising that, you know, what we see in the North is very conducive conditions for fall armyworm, given the, the level of damage uh, and the impacts that we're already seeing this species is causing to some of those crops, particularly in places like Central and Northern Queensland. But of course, you know, the modelling is a little bit more nuanced. And in fact, you know, the reality is a lot more nuanced than just looking at, you know, where this species can undergo um, year round development. And in fact, when we break it down to look at the conducive conditions uh, month by month for fall armyworm, we actually see that in fact, during the warmer months, so from late spring through summer uh, and into early autumn, well, indeed, fall armyworm can happily survive and happily undergo successful development in Victoria, um, in New South Wales. Sorry, Paul, we've lost your audio there for a second. I think you might be back now. Sorry, my, 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 uh, my headphones just went flat. There what we this go. is Sorry telling us is that uh, fall armyworm will certainly be able to migrate down during those warmer months, but more importantly, when it migrates down into our parts of the world, it's absolutely going to be able to persist for, for quite some time. And so it will be able to develop um, over the summer period, it will be able to successfully go through its life cycle. But importantly, it, uh, I guess it, it means, or at least the modelling is telling us, that it won't be able to persist year round. So it will eventually become locally extinct in our part of the world as conditions cool off over the winter months. Um, so clearly, I guess what this is telling us that as we now are getting close to, I guess, the, the, the fall armyworm season, if you like, um, in southeastern Australia, um, our summer monitoring, our summer crops, particularly things like maize and corn, we certainly need to be very vigilant. We need to be monitoring these crops actively um, because we do know that fall armyworm will happily persist uh, during that warmer part of the year in our part of the world. So our message, I guess, is certainly be alert, but perhaps we don't need to be as alarmed, um, unfortunately, as our counterparts further north. Um, I guess I'm just going to wrap up by just, uh, I guess, making it clear that fall armyworm is still a notifiable pest in New South Wales, as it is in other jurisdictions. So if you do think you have found fall armyworm, um, and again, we're about to come into the season when we're likely to start to see caterpillars um, in some of our crops. If you, if you suspect you've got fall armyworm, uh, I guess we're still asking people to call the exotic plant pest hotline. Um, or contact, you know, I guess the New South Wales State Biosecurity contact. I think the, I guess the, the request there is you can attach a photo of, I guess, the larvae that you're seeing, or in fact, if you're, you're seeing a moth and you suspect that's full armyworm, um, or if in, if in doubt, uh, contact your local uh, entomologist, and I'm sure they'll be able to guide you through the process. Uh, in terms of any further reading or some useful resources, um, if you're interested to learn a little bit more about armyworms more broadly, you can go to the CESA website and look up our pest note on armyworms. Um, fortunately, since I guess armyworm uh, came into the country a couple of years ago, there has already been a wealth of information that's been garnered um, and has been consolidated in some really useful resources. There's great information on the Beat Sheet website. There's some really good information on the, the GRDC website, the New South DPI website. And there's also this document, the Fall Armyworm Continuity Plan. If you're so inclined and you really want to understand more about this species, obviously I've really just glossed over a few aspects today. Um, I really would encourage you to get your hands on that Fall Armyworm Continuity Plan, which you can download free from the GRDC website. Certainly well worth a read. And finally, uh, for those that aren't already um, part of the PestFact Southeastern subscriber list, uh, do feel free to join. It's a free service funded by GRDC. 
Um, we cover a whole range of invertebrate pests and beneficials across Victoria and Southern and Central New South Wales. Um, if you'd like further information, send an email to Lizzie or to the pestfacts at seedsaustralia.com email address, or you can find us on Twitter. Um, and with that, I'll leave it there and we'll pass over to Lisa, who um, no doubt will give us some great insights into what we're seeing locally um, already in Australia with full army worm and, and I guess what we need to keep an eye out for in terms of management. So thanks, Lisa. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks so much, Paul. I've put most of those links in the chat there for people who are interested. You can follow up on those. Uh, and just a reminder that if you do have a question, you're very welcome to write those into the chat so we can follow up afterwards. Uh, otherwise, we'll have the opportunity for everyone to unmute themselves and ask questions at the end. Sorry, Lizzie, I've just lost my screen there. No, that's okay. Sometimes it takes a bit of a lag. Are you seeing that there? Not yet, no. Oh, sorry. There we go, it's coming through. Okay. Have you got that there now? Uh, yep. Perfect. Thanks so much, Lisa. Okay, sorry about that. Technology is great when it works, isn't it? <laughs> oh, look, thanks, Lizzie. And look, th thanks again for the opportunity to speak today. Um, look, I guess um, this presentation, look, it's really just intended to provide you with, with some information, you know, that's hopefully going to support your decision making in the management of full armyworm. Um, so, look, I just want to touch briefly on, on some of the benefits of having um, a surveillance program in place. Um, I guess just as a, a, an early warning system, um, you know, so, so that we, are, you know, can be on the front foot in, in terms of, of, of management of fall armyworm. Um, and the other thing I wanted to do today was just, just share some of the, the recent research that DPI has done, looking at insecticide toxicity um, and resistance in fall armyworm. Um, and, and just to explore some of the science um, that underpins some of those recommend, recommendations for management, you know, that you'll often see coming through in some of the messaging, uh, from, you know, from, from people like DPI and LLS or, and CESAR as well as, as, well as other, um, I guess, industry groups. And so then uh, from a practical perspective, um, what then does that research tell us about, you know, what's, what's gonna work in terms of, of management options? Um, what's probably not going to work um, and, and what are likely to be the, the best chemical options for the control of full armyworm. Because I guess one of the biggest challenges with full armyworm is that you really do need to target your control measures on the early stages of, of larval development. You know, because once larvae become established in the worlds and the ears of plants, look, it doesn't really matter how good your product is, the larvae just won't get the level of exposure to insecticides that, that, that you really do need for, for that product to produce a lethal dose. You know, so moth surveillance is a really important first action in management because it gives, it gives you that early warning of any localised moth activity, which means, as I said, you can really be on the front foot for managing any outbreaks. Now, DPI is working closely with LLS in managing the network of pheromone traps that we have, um, have deployed across the, the state um, over the, 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 the last few, few weeks, I guess. And updates from that trapping program um, are currently being reported to LLS every week. And, and that information is then available to be rapidly extended back to the regions, which is really where it needs to be. 
um, to, to help to help you guys um, in in sort of in, in planning for, for any management intervention that you need. Um, and it's really important to then follow up on that moth surveillance with um, you know obviously regular in crop monitoring for the presence of larvae, uh, and, and I guess also to be checking for um, for um, any signs of crop damage as well. Just trying to forward. Oh. Just trying to forward on from there, but um, I, I guess the other thing to say is that, it, as as Paul mentioned earlier, um, uh, I've just lost my screen. Sorry. I guess as Paul was 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 mentioning there earlier, it's all, all, all also really important to understand what the species composition is in your crop. So, so so is is fall armyworm present? Um, or are there other other armyworms um, species present there, or or is it another species entirely that you're dealing with? So DPI also provides uh, a free service for larval identification, um, so that if you do do need you know any, to get confirmation of what you do have in your crops, um, all you all you have to do is submit clear photos to the email address um, that you can see there on your screen, which is um, full armyworm at DPI. Uh, .nsw.gov.au and there's a team of entomologists across the state who, who monitor that email and can respond to your inquiries. And then if populations are um, present and above threshold and sprays are warranted, then obviously the best results um, are going to be achieved by timely application of insecticides, you know, as we've said, you know, well before the larvae get a chance to, um, to bury themselves into the, the wells and ears of plants, you know, at which point, you know, chemical control is going to be a whole lot more difficult to achieve. Now, there is an abundance of product available under permit for fall armyworm. And this table just lists the actives which are currently available for you. So, the, the most selective products are the ones highlighted in green there at the top of the table. Um, and these are the biologicals, so, so the BTs and the virus products. Uh, the blue section has the more selective chemical options, and then you've got the broad spectrums at the bottom of the table there. Now, there are other products with full registration for armyworms in general, and you can find a full list of registrations on the APVMA website. And the DPI website is actually also a really good resource as well because it lists registrations by crop type and, and that's really quite a useful thing, thing to have. Um, look, but it is really important to realise that just because something's registered, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually going to provide any kind of effective control for fall armyworm. And in fact, some products might actually be doing more harm than good. And the problem is, is that when fall armyworm first arrived in Australia, it was always going to be carrying a legacy of exposure to broad spectrum insecticides, you know, which have obviously been used on a global scale for decades for controlling fall armyworm. And so this was obviously going to have an impact on just how useful some of those products were likely to be in the Australian context. And so by understanding what those pre-existing levels of resistance are, look, it should help you to make much better spray decisions. And, and also help you to optimise the cost of your control. So I guess today I just wanted to share some of the results um, from, from some of the efficacy studies that we've been doing over the last 12 months, uh, which compare product performance in fall armyworm and helicoverpera midra. And the reason for using that approach was because, well, we already have a pretty good sense of how our midra responds to insecticides in the field. And so we can use that as a bit of a standard for comparison, you know, to benchmark insecticide toxicity in fall armyworm. So in other words, do insecticides perform as well in the two species or are they better or worse in one species compared to another? And so then what does that mean in terms of how effective these insecticides are likely to be for controlling fall armyworm? So I'm going to work through some graphs in the next few slides, and I'm going to start off with the more selective chemical options, and then I'll move on to, um, to the broad spectrums. Um, now, do bear in mind that these are laboratory assays, right, not field trials. So the dose response is not necessarily related to field rates. But look, it is still a pretty good indicator of um, relative, the relative difference in product efficacy between the two species. 
So just a couple of things to point out about these efficacy data. Now on the y-axis, you can see a black dotted line running horizontally across the graph at the 50% mortality mark. And this just marks the median lethal concentration or the LC50 of the insecticide. Now you can also see a red dotted line running vertically down the graph. Now this just marks the diagnostic concentration of insecticide. And this is just what we use to discriminate between resistant and susceptible insects. So I guess the, the, the critical point here is when the red data point points cross the red line. And this essentially means that there's reduced sensitivity to that product in fall armyworm compared with our midra. And it basically means that there is some level of resistance to that product. So this graph here shows the dose response for spinadaran. So this is the success neo product. And you can see that we pretty much have the same level of toxicity in both fall armyworm and armidra. Now the kill rate at the top end of the dose range was similar in both species. And we saw a very high level of mortality at the diagnostic dose, which means that fall armyworm is basically not carrying any resistance to spinadaran. Now we found a very similar thing with the other group five product, which is spinosad, um, also known, known as Entrust. Um, and, and there was equal, again, equal toxicity in both species and again, high mortality at the diagnostic dose. So again, no evidence of resistance to, to spinosad either in fall armyworm. Now, these are the results for emamectin benzoate. Now, this is a firm in broad acre or, or proclaim in horticulture. Uh, now, at the LC50 level, fall armyworm was about two times less sensitive than armidra but there was a very similar kill rate at the high end of the dose range. And there was also very high mortality at the diagnostic dose. So again, this tells us that fall armyworm is not carrying resistance to emamectin benzoate. Now there was a very similar story for the group 28 product chlorantranilaprol. Now this is Ultacor in broadacre and Corrigem in horticulture. And here again, we saw about twofold lower toxicity on fall armyworm compared with our midra at the LC50 level. But again, there was a similar kill rate at the high end of the dose range and very high mortality at the diagnostic dose. So again, no evidence of resistance to group 28 um, in fall armyworm. The story with indoxicarb is, is, is a little bit different. Now, now this is steward in broadacre and avatar in Horty. And you can see there that the red dots actually cross over the red line. Now, this means that there's been reduced sensitivity to indoxicarb in fall armyworm compared to armidra. Now, at the LC50 level, indoxicarb was about 13 times less toxic on fall armyworm than it was on armidra. And there was significantly lower kill in fall armyworm at the top end of the dose range as well. And we actually found that about 15% of the larvae survived at the diagnostic dose of indoxicarb. Now, it's not really clear why we do see this difference in sensitivity between the two species. And look, it might just be a natural tolerance thing that we're seeing in fall armyworm um, uh, in terms of indoxicarb toxicity. Look, but, but, but regardless of, of, of what, what's causing that, it does mean that, that even under the most ideal spray conditions, you know, you might still see some larvae coming through um, in doxycarb sprays. So moving on to the broad spectrums, which of course are the ones with the highest non-target impacts. So in other words, these are the ones that will take out the naturally occurring beneficials in your crops. And these data are for the group one insecticide methamyl, uh, which is a carbamate insecticide. Um, and this one is particularly hard on beneficials. Um, it also has acute toxicity in aquatic invertebrates, you know, not to mention the fact that it's a Schedule Eight poison in humans. So, so look, I guess not, not, a, lo not a great deal to love um, um, for, in methamyl. So, so now fall armyworm was about three times less sensitive to methamyl um, than armidra at the LC50 level. And I guess even though that doesn't sound like very much of a difference, Fall armyworm were very, very hard to kill at the top end of the dose range. And half of the larvae actually survived at the diagnostic dose, which, which means obviously that there's a reasonable amount of resistance to methamyl in fall armyworm. Um, and it means that methamyl, you know, obviously may not provide particularly good control at the field level, especially if, if spray, conditions, spray conditions are not optimal 
and um, particularly if the larvae are more than just a few days old. And, and you, you actually do see a very similar thing in methamyl resistant armidra, which we, we know can also survive um, at the field rate of methamyl. Now, these levels of resistance are probably due to the presence of a thing called the ACE1 mutation. And work done by DPI found that this mutation was present in 100% of full armyworm larvae that were analysed. You know, so it was so it's really little wonder that we do see so much survival um, at the diagnostic dose of methamyl. Now, the ACE1 mutation also confers strong cross resistance to other group one insecticides, so things like chlorpyrifos. So chlorpyrifos is an organophosphate, which is also highly disruptive to natural enemies. And so not surprisingly, we found a very similar resistance profile for both methamyl and chlorpyrifos in fall armyworm. So like methamyl, chlorpyrifos was about three times less toxic on fall armyworm than it was on armidra at the LC50 level. And again, fall armyworm larvae were very hard to kill at the top end of the dose range. And actually about 30% of the larvae survived at the diagnostic dose, you know, which you know, obviously means moderate to high levels of resistance to chlorpyrifos. And finally, these are the data for the synthetic pyrethroid alpha cypermethrin, which again is a very non-selective insecticide. And we found a highly significant reduction in sensitivity in full armyworm. So in other words, very high levels of resistance to alpha cyp. It was about 70 times less toxic on full armyworm um, um, than on susceptible armidra at the LC50 level. Um, and the larvae were extremely hard to kill at the top end of the dose range and there was less than 10% mortality at the diagnostic dose. And in fact, full army worm was even harder to kill than SP resistant armidra. Um, so in other words, it's highly unlikely that cypermethrin is gonna provide effective control of full army worm. And I guess really all you're achieving by spraying SPs is to destroy the one thing that will actually help you to suppress those full army worm populations, which are, which are of course the naturally occurring beneficials um, in the crop. So just to summarise um, those findings, so we found no resistance to, to some of the more selective groups, so spinosins, imamectin, benzoate or group 28, meaning that these products should be effective for controlling fall armyworm um, if they are used correctly. Um, there was a lower activity of indoxicarb in fall armyworm, most likely due to natural tolerance, um, which, which may reduce field effectiveness on fall armyworm. So even though we currently have no resistance in some of those key selective products, that, that could easily change if insecticide use increases in crops, you know, like maize and sorghum. And it could also put more selection pressure on our midra because, you know, th those are the two crops where, where, where both of those species are likely to occur together. So it is going to be important to pra practice resistance management when you're making spray decisions in those crops. So for the broad spectrums, uh, you know, obviously there is a moderate to high resistance to carbamates and OPs in fall armyworm, you know, most likely due to the presence of that ACE1 mutation. And there's very high resistance to synthetic pyrethroids, which means very high risk of field failures if you use that product. Um, so although there is no current, you know, currently no formal uh, resistance management strategy for fall armyworm, I guess, you know, the key principles of resistance management and IPM should always apply when you're making your spray decisions. And of course there, you know, um, there are some, some key take home messages um, for management, which I'm just gonna finish off with in this final slide here. And of course, these include, obviously, as we've said, to monitor those susceptible crops regularly, um, because, you know, obviously the most effective applications are the ones which um, are going to target larvae before they become concealed in the leaf wells and the, and the ears of, of plants. Um, to use recommended economic thresholds, uh, and these are available on the, on the full armyworm um, continuity plan. To comply with label instructions and avoid prophylactic sprays. Uh, and, and if sprays are warranted, then, then use a selective option first to, to, to try and preserve um, those beneficials and to help to, to suppress fall armyworm. And if multiple sprays are needed, uh, then rotate products with different modes of action. 
And also consider the use of biological options such as BT and viruses, because these will also help to enhance IPM. Um, and they'll also help to ease selection pressure um, on those synthetic products. And I, and I guess above all, you know, to, to try and avoid where you can the use of broad spectrums because, because you know, this will, you know, spraying those products will obviously destroy the, you know, the natural advantage of having those beneficial um, insects present in your crop. So that's, um, that's pretty much all from me. Thanks, Lizzie. I'll just finish off with the final slide there. Yeah, thanks so much, Lisa. That was really wonderful. Hopefully really, really useful information for the people in the audience. Um, Paul's got a question through that's just come through here. Just before we get to that, I'm just going to um, stop the recording now. So everyone feel free to unmute yourself and ask um, the questions uh, that you may have or write them into the chat.